Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to a week of Linux and security news for the 17th of September 2017. Well I could have started with mention of the iPhone and how it's gained the feature that appeared in my Android phone uh, many years ago about the facial recognition but no that's a, that's a Unix phone anyway isn't it so uh, but I did like the post here due to password security policy we will be requiring all staff who get the new iPhone to have their face surgically altered every 90 days. Oh yes, a very wise move to alter your password every 90 days, or in this case, get surgery every 90 days. <laughs> On with the actual news, and uh, oh, it's completely blown up about Equifax, isn't it? Hmm. A breach that's affected 143 million Americans, as well as an unknown number of Canadians and Brits. And not just names and email addresses, oh no, social security numbers, actual names and addresses... That's a catastrophe. I know some people seem to think that losing credit card information is the worst kind of breach. No, you can get a new credit card number. Can you get a new date of birth? Can you get a new social security number? Actually, I don't know about the social security number side of things because I'm not American, but I'm guessing no. Anyway, the handling of the breach from Equifax has just been an absolute catastrophe, and I think they've rewritten the book on how not to handle the breach. This is a bit of a rundown from Hacker Noon. So Equifax created a website called Equifax Security 2017, which was designed to notify people of the breach. However, it runs a stock installation of WordPress, and there were issues with the SSL or TLS certificate. In fact, it was so bad in the information they were asking for that Cisco's own OpenDNS decided the website was a phishing threat and blocked it. <laughs> nice one. So the Equifax breach occurred between late May to early July, and they waited more than two months to notify their customers. So what did they do for those two months? Well, the top management sold all their shares, and that can only be described as insider trading, because they knew it was going to affect the company badly. They offered people to sign up to the Trusted ID program, but it required you to waive the right to sue them. And that was part of the uh, website as well, on the Equifax 2017 website. If you wanted to check if your social security number had been leaked, you had to waive your rights to sue. That, that is just disgusting, really. And in fact, it seemed to be more like a random number generator to declare if your number had actually been in the breach or not. Because I saw mention of a journalist who used his infant son's social security number with a random name, and it said his son's social security number was in the breach. Really? Uh, so had an infant applied for a credit card then? <laughs> sure, sure he had. So Equifax were using FireEye's services, and they hired FireEye to do a more in-depth investigation of the breach. But it turns out one of their employees registered the website equihacks.com before the official notification went out. Well, the possible hacker is offering to sell back the information that they've stolen for 600 bitcoins. And what does that equal? That's approximately 3 million US dollars, and that is the amount the Equifax executives made selling their shares. Well, that's a fair deal, isn't it? If it's actually a fair deal. I saw mention that FireEye had discreetly changed the wording on their website. So, what did the CEO of Equifax say? The zero day and targeted attacks that evade some of the simpler defenses and where you're going need next generation products like FireEye. Oh, yes. We looked at two or three other vendors in this space, but we put FireEye up against other two vendors. By far, FireEye detected and kept us secure from, from these issues. <laughs> A brave wording there, wasn't it? Hmm. So Equifax eventually owned up to what the cause of the breach was, and yeah, gotta love this. So from the register, the vulnerability was Apache Strats CVE 2017-5638 which was reported in the March 2017. Equifax was breached in mid-May 2017, realised it in July, and got around to telling the world in early September. If we take mid-May as the 15th of the month, Equifax had nine working weeks in which to apply the patch. This incident was entirely avoidable. Failure to apply critical security patches was the entire cause of the breach. I absolutely love what Florian said. This is why I don't trust big corporations. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. It is broken, but it's not noticeably broken, so it's fine. <laughs> yep, got to agree with that. 
Anyway, across to Linux news now. So an update on the Ubuntu 17.10 development, which is getting nearer to completion now. So GNOME 3.26 has been released, and ooh, that's a nice cake, isn't it? Mmm. <laughs> a laptop-like cake. So because Ubuntu 17.10 has already been using the beta of GNOME 3.26, it'll actually ship with the final release of GNOME 3.26. So that's great. You're not going to miss out there on the Ubuntu 17.10 release. So they've also been working on adding support for progress bars and urgent notifications to the dash to dock extension, and we ported dash to dock settings to the new control center layout for 3.26. We've been working with the GNOME community on documentation to help people transitioning from Unity to GNOME, and as mentioned about updates to Chromium. So yes, as I mentioned, GNOME 3.26, which is codenamed Manchester, has been released. So what does it offer us? Improved search? A new look to the settings. Unfortunately, my memory of GNOME just isn't good enough to really recognize the differences. So color emojis, and I don't appear to have the actual font here in my system, so missing out on that, but there's a picture of the emojis that you can have. So you can synchronize your browser using the Firefox Sync service. And there's a new look to the display settings. The new design brings relevant settings to the forefront, so it's easy to get an overview of how your displays are set up. When there are multiple displays connected, a simple row of buttons allows you to choose how you want to use them. And some other system refinements. Windows now smoothly transition when they're maximized, unmaximized, or snapped to one half of the screen. As well as looking good, this makes it easier to track what's happening on the screen. The size of Windows thumbnails has been increased in the activities overview, making it, e making it easier to pick out the window you want. The top bar now becomes transparent when there aren't any maximized windows. This is more attractive and gives a better sense of space. Well, that's good because the GNOME desktop is very wasteful on space at the top of the screen, in my opinion. The dialogues which inform you when an application is not responding have a new style, making them look more integrated and refined. And there's a few more changes there as well. So KDE Plasma 5.11 has entered beta stage of development, with the formal release expected in mid-October. So what do we have here? So new system settings design, notification history, task manager improvements, the new functions make it possible for applications to provide access to internal functions such as, such as a text editor's list of sessions, options to change the application or document state, etc. Depending on what the application is currently doing, moreover rearranging windows into group pop-ups is now possible, allowing the user to make the ordering of their open applications more predictable. On top of these changes, performance of the task manager has been improved for a smoother operation. A new feature, a new feature Plasma Vault. So for users who deal with sensitive, confidential, and private information, New Vault offers strong encryption features presented in a user-friendly way. So Plasma Vault allows to lock and encrypt sets of documents and hide them from prying eyes, even when the user is logged in. These vaults can be decrypted and opened easily. The Plasma Vault extends Plasma Activities feature with secure storage. Some app launcher improvements and some improvements to Wayland. I mentioned a few episodes back about a new Linux smartphone from Purism, which is called the Librem 5. Initially it looked like the desktop would be GNOME, but it turns out that it could be KDE, which I'm now more interested in because, because KDE seemed closer to providing a cross-platform desktop than GNOME did. There's currently a community effort for the new Librem 5 smartphone. So they've set out a small goal of 1.5 million, and so far they've only raised $398,000, that's 26.5% of their goal. They had some stretch goals as well. I don't know if they'll get there or not. One half million is not too bad a goal to ask for. It's certainly nothing like the 30 odd million goal that Canonical asked for for their phone, but yeah, wish them luck. I might be more interested in providing a donation towards this now with KDE. Well, it suits the rest of my working here in KDE, so yeah. Consistency is the key for me. OMG Ubuntu have done an article on what the new Ubuntu 17.10 default wallpaper looks like, and it's a little bit different to the other themes. Well, actually, no, it still has the orange and purple in it, but it has an outline of the animal in there. So that's an aardvark. It looks all right, but I would certainly be changing that because I'm a bit bored of that uh, orange and purple wallpaper. Something I noticed this week, this item of Chinese malware, which is more of a potentially unwanted application, is not recognised by Chinese antiviruses, which I thought was rather interesting. Hmm. Surely it's a coincidence, though. 
who knows. So let's scroll down the list to see which ones don't recognize it as malicious. And we have Baidu, Kingsoft, and Kiho 360, all Chinese antiviruses, all recognize the file to be benign. Actually, Alibaba might be an antivirus as well, but that uh, doesn't scan that type of file. And for this week's stupid news, and this was a submission from 8-Bit Keck, how a fish tank helped hack a casino. <laughs> Good old internet of tat. So it's a bit vague as to which casino it was that got hacked and what data has been taken, but the Washington Post have reported, hackers attempted to acquire data from a North American casino using an internet-connected fish tank. The fish tank had sensors connected to a PC that regulated temperature, food, and cleanliness of the tank. Somebody got into the fish tank and used it to move around other areas of the network, lateral movement, and send out data. The casino's name and type of data was not disclosed. However, the report said about 10 gig of data was sent to a device in Finland and then onwards to somewhere else from there. So it was not a Finnish hacker in this case, or very unlikely to be a Finnish hacker. So that just shows ingenuity and how Internet of Tat is just an absolute detriment to security. Well, that was a week of Linux and security news. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all later.